thank you for the invitation. It is my pleasure to be here today. And as you know, my, my topic is the unearthing the cause of ALS. So I'm going to discuss what caused the ALS and how the scientists discovered, made this discovery and what implications it has in understanding the disease mechanism and in drug development. And lastly, I will briefly discuss what the challenges we are facing and what opportunities we have in our future studies. What is ALS? The full, the full name for ALS is a myotrophic lateral sclerosis. A means no. Myo means muscle. Trophic means nourishment. So a myotrophic means no muscle nourishment. So that is muscle, we say muscle atrophy. So the muscle becomes smaller and smaller, not functional anymore. So this is the, the key feature of this disease. Lateral sclerosis. We know sclerosis means something hard, some, something solid. Lateral defines the spinal cord. Both sides of the spinal cord become hard. So clinically, the patient shows muscle atrophy, weakness, and pathologically, you can see the spinal cord becomes very hard. And this disease is not well known, was not well known before. And two years ago, the ice bucket challenge, ALS ice bucket challenge, made greatly awareness of this disease in public. There are several famous cases of ALS. And this is Lou Gehrig, and probably the most famous known baseball player in New York Yankees team. He was diagnosed of ALS when he was 36. He died two years later. And the Stephen Hawking, the famous the theoretical physicist and the cosmologist, he was diagnosed of ALS when she was 21. She's now 74. So she has just been with the disease for over 50 years. And this is the Chairman Mao, the former leader of China. He, he suffered this, this disease when she was 80. And 24 years ago, when I was invited by Dr. Tipu Speed to join the ALS research team at Northwest, Northwestern, all the way from China. I never thought my family or myself would be personally affected by this terrible disease. And this was changed four years ago. And my father-in-law started, started to show the disease symptom, ALS. And he died just two years ago with the duration of the disease, only two years. And in the last I went, actually, I went back to China to took care of him for the last one month of his life. And I couldn't, we couldn't do anything. I couldn't do anything. No one else can, could do anything. Just watching, watching him dying quietly. So I fully understand the struggle of the, struggle of the patients with the disease and the frustration and the burden of the uh, families. So from this, representative cases of ALS. You can see the ALS strikes people all over the world, everywhere. And it, it can strike the people very young. And Stephen, Haw Stephen Hawking has the disease 20, 21 years old. But some people can develop this even earlier, in that six, five years old. And it can also strike the older people, 70, 80, 90 years old. But in general, the, this disease the onset of disease is after 50 or after 60 years old. That means it's a late life, and in the late of life. And the duration of the disease is only three to five years. That means after it's diagnosed, disease is diagnosed, generally survival is three to five years. <clears throat> and the, the, the key problem is the, the, you, the patient cannot breathe anymore, and the, respiratory failure. And in the United States, 6,000 people 
are newly diagnosed every year. And if, if we count today, we have 60, we have 30,000 less patients today. <clears throat> There's no effective treatment for this disease. And we know the key problem is the, is the, is the muscle, the muscle wasting atrophy. If the patient cannot eat anymore because of the muscle of time muscle problem, so the treatment is give the patient a, a feeding tube. That's, the, that's what the doctor can do. And we can see the muscle atrophy in the hand, and so it makes, just makes the utensil easier for them to use. And if they can breathe, if they cannot breathe, then give the ventilation system to help them to breathe. And the patient cannot communicate because they of, of the muscle weakness of the tongue. And so if they can, still can, can type, use the computer, so give them a computer to communicate with the people. Eventually, the patient won't be able to use the computer anymore. So they will use, but the eye movement normally is not effective. So we can use the computer assisted assist device to monitor the eye movement, so they can use this way to communicate with the people. So what we can see clinically, the patient shows is the muscle problem. The real problem actually is in our central nervous system, in our brain and spinal cord. The neurons controlling this muscle have problems. And then we have two types of neurons. One is called upper motor neuron in the brain, in our brain. One is the, called lower motor neuron either in the lower part of the brain or in the spinal cord. And the upper motor neuron sends the message to the lower motor neuron to say what muscles need to contract. Then this lower motor neuron will send this signal all the way to the muscle. Then the muscle knows to, to contract. But in ALS, the low, either, actually they're both. The upper motor neuron cannot send the signal to the lower motor neuron. So the, the, low, the lower motor neuron do not know what to do. The patient will show the stiffness, the, the very stiff, we call it spasticity. If the lower motor neuron cannot send the message to the muscle, then the muscle has nothing to do. So the muscle will become smaller and smaller and weaker and weaker. So eventually won't function. So in ALS, we have both upper and the lower motor neuron problem. So the patient will show stiffness and muscle atrophy. This is the spinal cord section from a, the autopsy sample of an ALS patient. And this is a spinal cord. We can see the, there's an H-like structure here. These are the neurons where the neurons are located. And the neuron controlling the, our movement is located in this area, in this area as indicated by the arrow head. And the other parts actually are the nerves. And the nerves, this part is the nerve, or the nerve bundle from the upper motor neuron controlling the lower motor neuron. What we can see is the, these nerve bundles are purely staining, stained from the other parts of the, of the tracks. Let's think it over. Now, the, if we want to send a message from DC all the way to Chicago, we send some, some, some cargoes. Then you need to transport this, this, this cargo to Chicago. And these bundles, no bundles, just like the highway to trans, trans, transport. What we can see is this stain is pale, pale compared to these tracks. That means these tracks, this highway are destructive. Destruct, destructive. So we have two highways, one's here, one's here. They both highways send the signal to the neurons in this area. We can see these two highways are destructive. So the upper motor neuron cannot send the signal to the neurons here. Let's see what happened to these neurons. These are the neurons in this area. These are neurons in this area. Normally, we can see many more neurons 
in this area. It's at least 50% of the neurons are lost. And in these neurons, this looks like normal, like a black arrow, big arrows. And in these neurons, we can see something coating clamps inside. And this, like this one, these are affected neurons. <clears throat> After the, the higher magnification, we can see this, these coating clamps are just like a thread, thread-like. Either they're in the cell body or in the, in the process. This process <coughs> are the place where they can receive the signal from another neuron or send the signal, signal out. With the disease progression, we can see the cells, this protein clamps becomes more and more and bigger and bigger. And eventually, the, cell, the, cell, the neurons are full of these protein clamps before they die. There's no specific treatment for this disease. And normally, if we want to, this, this diagram is showing the, the drug developmental strategies. Normally, we need to understand what causes this disease. And if the cause, if a cause is identified, then we can, we can make the mouse model and we we'll see whether this cause can also lead to the disease in mice. And then we can use the mouse model to understand how the cause leads to the disease. So that, that is the disease mechanism. Based on what we find in the disease mechanism, then we can develop the drugs based on what we find in the disease mechanism. And then we can try these drugs to the disease mouse model first. If it's effective, then we can do clinical trials and apply to the patients. So to identify the, the cause is the first and the most important of, our, of the drug development. So what causes ALS? And we believe there are two components. One is environmental factors, and the other one is genetic component. And this disease was described 150 years ago, and all the way this 150 years. And the scientists try to find what caused, the, caused ALS. But obviously, this disease occurs <coughs> everywhere. It looks like it's random. And uh, so far, there's no confirmed or clear environmental factors has been proved to be the cause of the disease yet. <clears throat> but the, the ALS, we can say the ALS, in all, among all these ALS patients, about 90 to 95 percent, they just like, looks like a random. And there are 5 to 10 percent have family history. So the family history will suggest a genetic component. That is why we use the genetic form to identify the disease gene, then use this gene to understand the, 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 the disease mechanism. And based on our finding, then we develop therapeutic treatment. And importantly, the sporadic ALS and the familial ALS, actually they are clinically, they are not, dis, not distinguishable. So they may share the same disease mechanism. So if you develop a drug based on the familial form, they may be also applicable to the sporadic ALS as well. So that's why the scientists are currently focused on the genetic form. This, these are the genes identified in the past uh, three, 30, year, 30 years. And <coughs> different genes, they may cause there's some different phenotype and the pattern of transmission. But in general, they're very similar. They're very similar. Today, I'm going to describe use of three representative examples. And they have different, different transmission pattern and different clinical phenotype. And the, ones, the first one is SOD1. This is the, we say it's the dominant. LS2, that is the recessive. And LS15, that is X chromosome linked LS and some of the patients with dementia. Our genome, to find the, 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 the mutation in a gene in our genome, it's, it's, it's very difficult. And uh, our genome have two sets. One is from, from father, one is from mother. For example, each chromosome, we have one from father, one from mother. Our genome has 6.6 billion nucleotides. And half, father <coughs> gives you half, 
model give you half. And to find a single nucleotide, imagine you just like to ask the policeman to find a criminal, a single criminal in the world population. It's too much difficult. But this 6.3 billion are packed into, into 46 chromosomes and 23 pairs, just like the country. Some countries are big, some countries are very small. If we know the, the criminal, where the criminal is located, for example, in what country, what state, or what zip code, what street, then it will make the police the, the, the work much easier to find this criminal. <coughs> and the scientists also develop, develop a similar approach that's called linkage analysis. For example, in this family, we have five LS patients as blood dog. The, the male is square, female is circle. And see, this father passed the disease to the two of his daughter, and these two daughters passed the disease to the two sons. So from genetic point, they must share something. They must share something in this, in this patient. But actually, we know they share too many. We share, they share too many. Then we have to do a linkage analysis to see which gene, which the disease gene is on which chromosome. And this is the first work done by uh, an international group led by Dr. Thibault Stick. And eventually, using this linkage analysis, they found this gene is on the smallest chromosome of, you know, genome, chromosome 21. And this is chromosome 21. The zip code is here in this region. And later on, they sequenced the gene in those regions, and a team led by Dr. Robert, Robert Brown and the Tibus Leak eventually find the gene is called superoxide dismutase, SOD1. And eventually, they found uh, 14 mutations in 23 families. So after the, after the identification of disease gene, we want to know how the mutation causes this disease. And the, so we can make the, the animal models to mimic this disease. And the animal model, we can make animal model this way. We isolate the mutation in the, the, the disease gene from the human patients. Then inject this gene into a fertilized egg of the of the, in the mouse, and let this egg to develop a, to a mouse model. So this mouse will, will have the gene, the disease gene from the patient. The, the color is different, okay. You see, you can see the leg, the, the hind leg, stiffness, stiffness and para paralysis. So the mouse developed something very similar to humans. And this mouse also developed actually the front leg and hind leg. And we can see the stiffness and the weakness. They become very small, move very slow and slow. And this is the first LS mouse model we made. In the, and it's also the first neurodegenerative disease mouse model made. And the mice have very well defined the clinical onset. And it's about 100 days. And this mouse will die three to four weeks later. And this mouse is the most widely used LS mouse model so far and uh, to study the disease mechanism and for screening <coughs> of the therapeutic uh, approach, uh, strategies and uh, compounds or drugs. Very similar to uh, humans, pa human patient. We can also see this is spinal cord of the mouse. The protein clamps are there, are, are present. And then we started how these protein clamps are formed. And what we found is the, the molecule, the SOD molecule, 
normally they have two hooks. The hook inside tightens the, 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 the molecule. And two of the molecules form a functional protein. And if this one is mutated, then these two hooks are not hooked inside anymore. They hook outside. They hook, will hook with the other molecule. So we can see the hook one, hook two, hook three, hook four, hook five. To make the, we call it intermolecular. Normally it's intramolecular. The change to intermolecular makes the molecule very big. And these proteins will precipitate in the cells and they imitate these cells and they affect, affect, affect the cellular function and eventually make the cell die. So this pattern, we say this is the one type of, of ALS. They transmit from several generations and from <coughs> father to from father or mother to next generations all the way. And there's another type, it's recessive, we call it recessive. And this type of ALS normally have the the stiffness is more than the atrophy. And we can say this is the stiffness, the posture, and the, the tongue muscle and the face, and also they have the uh, the weakness, atrophy of the legs and the hand. This is a family, for example. Actually, their father and the mother, they're normal. Their father, mother, normal. But each, the father, each of the parents have a, have a affected allele. If they trans, trans pass the affected allele to a person, and this person, if both of them are affected, this will develop a disease. It's called recessive. And we also using the same approach. We found this gene is on chromosome 2Q33 in this region. This is this is a zip code. And we sequence the gene there, and eventually we found the gene mutation called LS2. And this protein, this one, will disrupt the protein. So this one is different from the previous one. The previous one is, you know, when it is it's mutated, it's toxic. It's toxic. And this one is different. This one is, you do not have this protein anymore. So you need this protein, and you don't have this protein. So that's why you need both of the both of the copies from you need the either one of the copy. For example, the, the parents they have one copy, they're okay. But if you have you do not have any copy, then you, you, you will develop disease. So this is called recessive, recessive LS. So recessive one, we use a similar approach to, to remove this gene in the mouse. In the mouse. And let's see what's, what, what, what we can see. And this is the normal mouse. This is the, the, the track, send the signal from from the brain to the spinal, to the uh, low motor neuron, and this lo looks okay. But in the mouse, we can see this recorded cortical spinal tract is degenerated. The highway is disrupted. So this is, this is the second type. The third type I want to introduce is the, some of the genes are located on X chromosome, on sex chromosome, X chromosome. And for example, in this family, we have 18, 18 patients, 19 patients. And interestingly, we did not find any transmission from father to the son. And this is the, the we eventually we map this protein to the X chromosome and in this region, in this region. And we sequenced 40 some genes in this region and eventually we found a gene called ubiquitin 2 mutation in this gene. And all the mutations, we found five families and all the mutations are in this region. We made the mouse model again, and what we found is, actually this mouse model did not show the motor phenotype, the movement are okay, but they replicate the dementia in the patients. <coughs> it means they have dementia problem, and actually dementia accounts for about 10 to 15% of the ALS patients. Most of, most of the patients are okay, but 10 to 15% they have the dementia. And what we found, the dementia is caused by the protein aggregates in the brain area, in the memory, in our memory area. And this is the diagram showing the, the neuron, the, the connection between neurons and neurons. And this is the neuron send a signal to this neuron. And this is the neuron receive the signal 
And what we can see, the major problem, these protein aggregates are located in this area. We call it dendritic spine, dendritic spine. So that is the major problem. That's why the patients have the dementia problem. <clears throat> and the, this protein plays an important role in the cellular, we say, sanitation system. Because, for example, in our community, we generate a lot of garbage every day. And this garbage needs to be removed. And in the cells, it's the same. They have the cells, they also have the sanitation system. In the sanitation system, we have to, so the garbage will be removed or recycled. And in our cellular system, if this is a protein, play the function, then this protein is damaged or need to be removed. Then they put a label there, say garbage. And this label is ubiquitin. And so ubiquitin label this protein, say garbage, then to remove. Then ubiquitin 2 or other ubiquitin proteins will bind to this one and move all the way to this trash can, proteasome system. And so this protein will be digested all the way, and the amino acids will be recycled. And the ubiquitin's problem is they can bind to this protein, they can bind to this, this, this proteasome, but it seems they cannot dump it dump it into this trash. So block the way, block the other protein binding and the dump the trash into this, into this uh, trash can. So the problem looks like, because we made the knockout of the mouse, we remove this one, you'll be putting two, the mouse are okay. But if you overexpress it, that's a problem. If, if, you, if you make the mouse model, overexpress wild type, it's okay. So that means the mutant one, has problem. They bind, what we found is they bind to the, to the, to the, to the arm, to the, this arm of the trash can, and they block the other's protein to bind. So that means the protein, mutant protein, it, it does not do any job, but prevent the other people to do the job. So that's the, <coughs> that seems the major problem. So far, as I said, we have over 20 disease causing, causing genes and some of the risk factors, genetic risk factors. This involves the different cellular process, like nuclear function, mitochondrial function, and the clearance sanitation system, or some of them just, we can see protein is aggregated there. And this seems they say <coughs> they're all involved in different systems, different pathways. But one, one phenomenon is common. Is in the cells, we can always see the protein clamps and accumulate the a lot of protein. And these proteins are ubiquitin positive, ubiquitin, 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 disease positive. They're all labeled by the cell, say this is garbage. So it seems the cell, the removal of this garbage the, the, is, a, is, a, is a common problem. But what are the challenges and opportunities we, 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 we have? And I will come back to this, this, this circle and find the disease gene, find the cause. And so far, we found the 32 genes. That accounts for about 70% of the familial LS and about 10% of the sporadic LS. And this is a great effort from the scientists and the neurologist in the world. And I feel obligated to mention at least two of, two of the neurologists. And Dr. Tipo Sleek at the Northwestern and Dr. Robert Brown Jr. Uh, at Massachusetts. And they take care of the LS patients for over 30 years. And they collect the clinical information and DNA samples from thousands of LS patients. And uh, their work has made the identification of the, the number of genes possible. <clears throat> and so our challenges, uh, one is our challenge is not all of the genes we identified, we can use this gene to make the mouse model. And the other one is we do not know what is the, com the common pathway 
in the in in in, in the in the disease, and uh, even though we screened the science screened using using this mouse model using the SOD one we developed we, we developed, and they screened over one hundred of the genetic modifier and uh, clinical like therapeutic compounds they screened like uh, two hundred, and they say use this use this data, and they have. Clinical trials, we have about 200 clinical trials, and there are 37 phase three clinical trials con conducted, and 27 are completed. And so far, except, except for a, a, a drug I mentioned, Vinozol, that only extends survival for two or three months. The others are all failed. And this is very disappointing, because generally, we have the trials, for example, phase three trials, we can, we can have 50% of success rate. But for, for the LS, we have so many, and they all fail, failed. And this is the, the major challenge. <clears throat> However, with the exome, whole exome sequencing study, and nowadays we can identify the disease gene much faster, much easier. And if we can understand, if we can understand the, whether the gene is toxic, for example, encode a toxic protein, like SOD1, like ubiquitin 2. If we remove it, and it seems that in the, at least in the mouse system, we do not see the apparent the, the, the side effect. And so with the newly developed gene editing approaches, we can directly edit this gene or remove these genes. I guess this will be the, the, the easiest way to develop the therapeutic uh, treatment, and we can bypass this this way. But anyway, re remember this one is only for a small fraction. For the major fraction, we still have to go go go, go this way. And you know, normally f from from the, from the research point, from all the way from the identify the cause and to the any model <coughs> to understand the disease mechanism, this one will be supported the federal funding. So NIH funding is critical to go all this way. Even though we have some other uh, private foundation like ALS Association, the Turner ALS Foundation, and some others, but the NIH funding is the key to make the further discoveries and eventually develop the treatment of the of ALS. You know, I I I anticipate this will be successful with our joint efforts. And uh, we can eventually develop the effective treatment for the LS patients and the safe, safe lives of, of LS patients, and like my, like my father, you know. And, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.